As you walk through the ancient Greek gallery of the Great North Museum in Newcastle, or any museum for that matter, for the most part, what you'll see is pottery. Not only that, but when most people think of ancient Greek pottery, they tend to think of a certain type of pottery, that is, Athenian figureware vases, often black and red, or red and black. Today, this pottery is rare, and so often ends up in museums, but in ancient times, pottery was used for everyday life, and was everywhere. The shape of pottery tells us something about its use. These, for example, are very masculine pots and shapes, used for drinking at gatherings called symposia, where men would gather, drink, and debate. At a symposium, large pots called craters were used to serve wine, and a smaller, flatter pot called a kylix was used to drink the wine. Incidentally, this is where we get the word chalice from. These, however, are more feminine pots and shapes, designed with different uses in mind. They include pots for storing and applying makeup, storing jewellery, and also keeping perfume. We'll hear more about feminine pottery in a moment, but first, let's see how exactly you make a Greek pot. Clay, dug from the ground, mixed with lots of water, settled out, get rid of the gravel out of it, get it down to a fine sort of consistency, and at that stage you can start to prepare it for the wheel. And what I'm doing here is I'm kneading it. I'm getting the air out, I'm mixing it up, I'm evening up the whole thing, getting it up to a consistency that can go onto the wheel head and produce a decent pot. And you might just hear the odd pop there, the pops of air bubbles coming out of the clay. And this is getting it up to a state which you can work on the wheel. Nice background sound of clay. Just getting nice and even now. You can't have any unevenness, wet bits, dry bits. It needs to be all the same consistency to work on the wheel nicely. There we go. And that should just about do the job. So I'll bring it up to a nice lump. And that will go on the wheel nicely. Right, potter's wheel. This one is a stick wheel or momentum wheel. As you can see, it's spun up to speed by using a stick and you get it spinning nice and fast. And when you've got it fast, the stick goes down, water goes on the clay and you start to centre. Now this type of potter's wheel was actually invented probably in Mesopotamia around about 3000, 3500 BC. It's a type of wheel which spread throughout the Mediterranean area, North Africa, out to the Far East. And if you go to in places like India and Pakistan, you'll still find it in use today. It's efficient, it's fast, it's cheap to build, easy to maintain. And as you can see what I'm doing, spin it up to speed. Now this time, I'm going to be squeezing the clay between my fingers on the inside, my fingers on the outside, and just drawing the clay upwards drawing it up into a cylinder initially and slowly building from that into the pot we want. The Greeks used the potter's wheel for producing not only domestic wares but very high status pottery as well. So some very very fine pottery was also made on the potter's wheel and it takes a great deal of skill to actually develop some of the forms that they made and I often refer to those forms as being look what I can do vessels because that's what they're doing. They're just showing off their skill, a level of skill that you don't really see in almost any other civilization. It is just extremely high quality wear. And as you can see now, I'm getting quite a tall cylinder. I'm getting it down up to a nice even thickness. And what I'm gonna do from this point is I'm gonna to start to expand the belly of the pot out and give it some shape. So the water goes on, and here we go, a bit of shape. I'm forcing the clay outwards from the inside with my hand in there, and just controlling it with my hand on the outside. 
So I'm bring it round again. This time, smooth the surface on the outside of the pot a little bit, using a bit of wood. There we go. One more time, and we'll bring the top in. And what we'll have is a Greek vase. There we go. Job done. Creating the shape of the pot was just the first stage. Next came the extremely skilled task of decorating it. As you might expect, this started with preliminary lines and sketches drawn onto the pot using graphite or charcoal. Then the so-called eighth of an inch line, which you can just about see here, was applied around figures and designs on the pottery before the background was filled in. This required an extremely steady hand, and the relief lines highlighted here by the light were incredibly thin, so eyesight must have been important too. Such tasks were probably done by young people with a steady hand, patience, and good eyes. Indeed, some believe you can trace the careers of potters because of their deteriorating eyesight and the quality of their work. These designs weren't just patterns and pretty decorations. They were a visual vocabulary, a language with stories which can be interpreted and understood to this day. This pot is a calathos. The calathos is rarely made in clay. It takes its name from basket, the wool basket. We don't know what the function of this pot was uh, in ancient Greece. It's certainly too small to have been used as a container for wool. But by looking at the images, we can begin to possibly understand what this pot could have been used for. It was made in Athens in the 5th century BC. It's red figure technique and it was found in a grave on the Musaean Hill in Athens. So if we look at the first woman, her head's missing, the pot's been broken. In fact, it's been broken several times. She's holding a wool basket, a calathos in her hand, which would have contained the wool used for weaving and spinning and she's walking towards the second woman. This woman is seated. She's holding a frame which would have been used to make probably small uh, belts or hairbands. And we can see one of these hanging up behind her. In front of her, there is a third woman. Uh, she is very heavily draped in her mantle. She's got it pulled over the back of her head. Possibly she's been outside or possibly it's a reference to marriage. She's also got an elaborate hairband uh, that we see brides wearing. We move on to the next figure. She has got her dress over her arms and she's in the process of tying her belt. Again, this could be a reference to marriage. High up in the background, there's a strange little pot called a formiscos, which was used as a container for knuckle bones, which were used as gaming pieces in ancient Greece. Then we move to another seated woman. Uh, she's got a hand raised. She's looking at herself in a mirror. And coming towards her, the final woman, a little bit smaller, possibly a servant, she's got short hair, holding a couple of perfume vessels, an alabastron and a plemacoi. And between them, in the background, we can see two small objects, which are castanets. So what we have here are women shown in the household, engaged in the two activities which we see represented time and again on painted pottery, wool work and beautification, uh, putting on makeup and jewellery. And it seems likely that this pot may have been intended for a bride and been given as a wedding present, which eventually ended up in the grave of the woman who owned it. So, Pottery was used by almost everyone 
every day in the ancient Greek city-states. Some pots were mundane, used and thrown away fairly quickly. Others were special and kept even until the grave. Ancient Greek pottery not only offers us insights into how people lived in the past, but also what they thought and believed, what was special to them. But no matter the pot, the technique and skill of ancient Greek potters would have been important to everyone. So why not potter through the Greek gallery at the Great North Museum and see what you can spot?